to have you guys on the panel today. Um, just so you know, my name is Jackie Florian with 91.8 The Fan, and uh, we have our special guests willing and waiting to answer questions about voiceover. The way the panel is going to go is I'm going to ask some basic questions, and then the second half we're going to have your questions about voiceover and all the tips and tricks that you guys want to ask. So make sure to look forward to that. And just so you know, we have a lovely singer coming up, introducing the singing voice of Princess Luna and Rarity, Kazuma Evans. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> well, I know, I know that we also have the wonderful Kelly Sheridan. Keep watch of your cutie marks. This is the voice of Starlight Glimmer, as well as the voice of Songo from Inuyasha. <laughs> Did that door open? <laughs> I know they're out there. I went and met them, I swear. <laughs> if not, I have a portal gun. I can just use that to get them here. That might work. That's why I brought it, just in case. That's the best way to get voice actors to show up to a panel. <laughs> so I think we're going to check to make sure that they're all ready. I was told to get up here and introduce everything. But uh, just for you guys out there, um, this is going to be a pretty educational panel. I want to make sure that your questions about voiceover is answered. Um, this is definitely for people who want to get into the business or they're looking for tips and tricks and things like that. <laughs> Yeah, I totally did. <laughs> See, I told you, the portal gun works. <laughs> Sorry, we can't hear out there, so I just heard no. a pause, and I was like, oh. Okay. Oops. We peeked <laughs> in, and there's this booming silence of everyone going, eh? <laughs> Cricket, <laughs> cricket. <laughs> My bad, I didn't know you guys couldn't hear out there, but they said, go up, go introduce them. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now... We got to start with the very basic, which is the question you guys hear at every panel. But I believe every voice actor and every actor is introduced um, to the business in a different way. Mm -hmm. So what was your own journey getting into the business? Not specifically just voice acting, but acting itself. OK. Um, well, for me, as a child, um, I always like mimicked uh, cartoons or you know accents or whatnot. Actually, in the first grade, I had a, a teacher who was a substitute teacher, and she was from England, and she was British. And so, naturally, and it still happens, like, I just can't help it when someone has an accent, I just want to mimic back. So, uh, she'd be like, oh, now it's mathematics, all right? So, like, oh, it's mathematics, you know? And so, then she thought I was mimicking her and being rude. So, I got into a lot of trouble with it, and uh, she called in my mom, and my mom's like, no, 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 she just does that, it's a thing, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and as I uh, got older, I became more and more interested in uh, performing, and I informed my mom uh, one day when I was about nine years old on a cruise ship that I wanted to sing in the talent contest that was on the cruise ship. And uh, then I eventually started uh, in amateur theater and then uh, moved into professional theater. And uh, the agent that represented me about five years ago before the show started, he asked me if I was interested in doing voiceover work for cartoons. And I said, oh yeah, you know, sounds like fun, right? Uh, and so I started auditioning and actually My Little Pony was my first job. Voice of, voiceover job ever. <laughs> what a way to start. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and uh, ever since then, I'm pretty proud to say that uh, I've been, it's, I do this full time. Uh, but yeah, Daniel Ingram pulled me into his studio in his apartment at the time and said, oh, like, uh, can you sing the theme song for the show called My Little Pony? Um, and eventually, uh, I think at first they were looking at me for the singing voice for Twilight Sparkle. But then he's like, oh, you know what? I think you're more a rarity. And I was like, sure. <laughs> and um, yeah, the rest is history. So it's been a really fun ride for the past five to six years. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So what about you? Yeah. Hey, Kazumi. Um, blackmail. <laughs> uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> I was a uh, theater brat. I was a super precocious, really into theater. Um, I once asked my mom, like, what would you have done with me if you hadn't had the idea of, like, putting me in theater when I was a kid? She goes, I don't know. 
you were so busy. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I was always into stuff. So, uh, yeah, I did amateur theater when I was young and toured internationally with this ensemble um, theater company made up of young teens. And the woman that ran that theater company also um, had an agency for young people that Richard Cox was in when he was younger. Uh, maybe even a few other pony peeps. I'll have to think about who was in that one. But, um, yeah, and she would send me on auditions for stuff. And one day I auditioned for a voiceover gig and didn't get the gig that I went into audition for, but the director for another show happened to be there at the same time and overheard my audition and went, hey, let's cast this kid in this thing we're doing next week. So that was my first gig. And at the time, I was one of the only young women in Vancouver doing voiceovers, like one of the only kind of kids doing voiceovers. So I got in there early and got a lot of work because there wasn't a lot of competition at the time. And now there's lots of fantastic competition. Oh, stop. And, um, and you just form relationships with people. I and mean, when I met Terry Klassen, who's the voiceover director for My Little Pony, he was an actor. He was a voiceover actor. And so we were in a bunch of shows together when I was a kid. And then he transitioned into directing. And you just sort of live in a city and work in a career long enough. And I've been really lucky to build my career that way. Plus blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. As we said, every path is different into acting. Um, one thing that I hear for everybody who has, you know, no acting background is that you should take classes. So my question is, what classes meant the most to you that you took, or what classes would you recommend for people trying to get into acting? Um, for me, uh I think, you know, I think Kelly would agree probably, is live theater training of any sort. Like, I, I feel like live theater prepare, prepares you for anything because it's one of, um, it, and it's something that, like, unless you do it, it's very hard, uh, like, it, 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 like, you learn so much on the job or even just doing amateur theater, right? Because it, if something goes wrong on stage, especially when it's live, what do you do? What do you do to recover that, right? And the more it happens, the better you get at that. And it's not something you can teach uh, in a classroom, to be honest. So I think uh, just whether it's trying out for the school play, whether it's uh, joining an amateur theater company and just trying to get out, uh, get some practice that way, I think that's the best way to go about it. Or any sort of uh, live theater classes, of course. Yeah, I would agree with that. Live theater, um, you know, theater school, amateur theater, improv is oh, really, yeah. really great. Yeah. Because oftentimes with our job, you show up and you haven't even seen the script or you don't know exactly what you're auditioning for and you're just handed a thing and shoved in a room and you have to make choices and go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's uh, something that just comes, well, it's partly just inherently in a personality of if you're the kind of person that goes, yeah, to that. <laughs> uh, but it's also just experience, just experiencing being put on the spot and not having judgment about what you're doing and just making a choice and kind of committing to it. And the other thing theater training really helps you to do is to take direction. So there's two words in voice acting. One is voice and one is acting. And you can be a great um, impressionist, you can do a great Stewie or Homer or whatever, but they already have a Stewie, they already have a Homer, and rarely are directors looking for a mimic. They want someone who can come up with a unique voice of their own, but then who can also make choices and take direction. That's the acting part of it. Mm -hmm. So you come in with some choices, but you have to adapt what you're doing based on what the other actors in the room are doing, and you have to be able to take direction on a dime and kind of interpret what someone's telling you into how you're gonna make that change your performance. And oftentimes in a room you have a voice director, you have an animation director, you have a couple of producers, you have a technician that's saying, oh, you're popping your peas on that line or you need to stand this way in front of the mic or this way or um, um, learning how to give space in between lines for them to pull up the faders in between each line. So there's lots of like technical stuff and learning being used to taking direction and kind of working quickly with other people is something you learn in theater school, and that's indispensable for voiceover work, I think. Absolutely. Fantastic advice. That's amazing. <laughs> for, for the fans out there um, who do know a little bit about voiceover, a lot of people's 
not necessarily end goal, but their goal to really start pursuing is to get that demo out. When you guys are working on your next demo, what exactly are you looking for um, in terms of a character demo, since I, I believe most people here are interested in character. <laughs> what are you looking to put in that sort of demo? Um, I believe that when uh, producers or directors are listening to demos, they want a lot of diversity. So a lot of different characters, different age ranges, because say if a character's older, it's gonna be slower paced. If a character's uh, younger, they're gonna have higher energy and therefore they're gonna speak a lot faster and be higher energy. So a lot of diversity and um, keep it short and sweet. Uh, nothing too long over a minute, I would say. Um, yeah, because it's pretty much you want to have uh, all your highlights uh, and for, for them to view, right? So nothing too, too long, I would assume. And I would say things that, as much diversity as possible, but all things that you feel really strong and comfortable mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. It's rather to have a sh better to have a short demo with um, four or five things that you feel really strong about than a demo with 20 things when only five of them you feel sure about and the other ones are kind of experiments or you're still working on it or not sure. You want to show your really strong stuff and, and that's it. And then just develop the other stuff on the side on your own time. Oftentimes I get cast with just my regular speaking voice mm -hmm. and the characters are different because of their moods or nuances or um, you know, that kind of thing. It's rarely to do with like a pitch being higher and lower or accents or that kind of stuff. Like sometimes I get cast for something that sounds very different from my normal speaking voice, but I often get cast just kind of doing this. Like Starlight's not that far away from this. It's really easy to do this. Like that's not that far away, but the personality is very different. So I would say don't worry about sounding like, you know, a five-year-old kid and an 80-year-old lady and like, yeah. a military Russian and you know a whole bunch of stuff all in one demo if you're not comfortable with that like stick with what you feel is really strong. Military Russian is my personal favorite. Yeah I don't even I'm know what very, that would be but I'm very good at you know like that's my strongest one. Cool. <laughs> Same with Kelly's. Yeah. We should what? take the show on the road. I think we should. <laughs> da, 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 da. Well actually bringing up accents um, a lot of people learn through mimicking but um, what other resources would you recommend for people to get something authentic? Well, if you want to get an Australian accent, I'd assume going to Australia, you know, and hunting with kangaroos and <laughs> crocodiles. And, um, yeah, uh, for me, just trying to find a native speaker yes. uh, from that country, so Australia, my, I'm very fortunate that I have a sister that lives there. So every time I come back from Australia, I definitely have the twang. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. That, that's what I would suggest, is finding a native speaker and just getting them, um, say if you have a script, to read out uh, the script for you in their normal speaking voice and then copying their inflections and uh, their little vocal nuances. Yes, I think that's a great tip for sure. Um, YouTube is good. There's lots oh, yeah. of, what's that thing that went around a few years ago, accent tag, I think it's called, mm -hmm. where a bunch of, you know, just anybody from anywhere, they'd have a set bunch of things that you'd have to read in just your normal voice, your normal regional accent, and that's a great way to get a gist, like if you don't know anyone who's Croatian, that's a great <laughs> way to, you know, look up that kind of accent. Um, and then there's also the IDEA, which is the International Database for, I-D-E-A, I don't know what it stands for, but it's like a dialogue database where you can look up a specific accent of a specific region, of a specific age, specific gender, how long they've lived in that place, oftentimes um, different socioeconomic things that they come from, because, you know, a Cockney accent is going to sound very different from a, you know, from like an upper class British accent. And that's really great because it's, they have a set little bit of dialogue that they have that person read, and then they conduct a little interview where you just hear their regular conversational speaking voice. So that's a good one, too. Yeah. Idea, I D E A. Really cool. So, on the other side of the spectrum, because I want to just 
you know, mention this for the people interested in commercial and narration, um, for being casual, I find a lot of my peers struggle with this because they, they are so focused on characters. So what advice would you give to be more casual? Like it, it, like in a radio commercial or just? Yeah, more co a more commercial type of media or oh, narration. Oh, okay. Um, what I find uh, that helps, because uh, I do teach voiceover as well, is telling my students to imagine that their best friend is in front of them. And oh, that's a good one. Yeah, like, well, I, 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 I hope so. <laughs> I'm going to try that. <laughs> I've like, never tried that. I'm otherwise, that. I'm giving really bad advice. No, that's great. <laughs> that's really good. Uh, well, I find that that's what helps me personally, right, is uh, just imagining my best friend or someone who's really close to me in front of me and as if I'm speaking uh, the script to them. And then, because uh, I find when a lot of people get into the booth and they have commercial copy in front of them, the natural instinct is to go into selly selly mode and, you know, here today at the brick, we have a deal for. Yeah. Um, How many times have you seen written on a breakdown, like not selling, like not, don't push the product. That's yeah. something that happens all the time. It, totally. But they want you to sell and push the product at it, the same time. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's hard. It's like when you go into a shop, for example, and then you have that one really annoying salesperson that follows you around the whole shop that's just hanging on like you know like over your shoulder being like oh can I show you this can I show you that yeah like I think when someone hears a commercial uh, on the radio or the TV they don't want to hear that voice kind of come out they want to trust you instinctively so it's kind of a fine balance between um, making it sound very conversational and naturalistic and as if it is a friend speaking to them but at the same time you know bringing the product forth then you know suggesting it rather than pushing the sale. Yeah, I find oftentimes it's just like slightly emphasizing the product names. Yeah. Just like putting a little bit of stress on those rather than, you know, buy a McDonald's! <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my pitch to McDonald's. Now. <laughs> well, you can um, tell me just about anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, like it's the same with animation is listening to the kind of things that you could see yourself auditioning for. So listen to radio commercials, like listen to the kind of things that are on the radio. And the, there's often trends with performance and delivery. And the trend seems to be now with animation as well, more naturalistic. People want that kind of filmy thing. Oftentimes the references you're given are movie stars and film stars that just kind of talk like how we're talking right now. Um, so yeah, just listen to the kind of things that you see yourself auditioning for. And there's a certain kind of musicality to the way that people talk that often is very similar from across product lines from commercial to commercial. So yeah, those are good to listen to. Yeah. And I love the fact that you mentioned trends because, you know, it wasn't too long ago that they, it was a male-dominated market and they were all doing, you know, the announcer voice, you know, very right. prime and proper. And it seems like, you know, as you said, trends are more conversational, but are there any other trends that you guys are noticing? I've seen a lot of millennial stuff lately. <laughs> and, and kind of some vocal fry. Yes, lots of vocal fry. <laughs> Have you had a lot of um, Adventure Time as a reference? I like, yeah. love Adventure Time. Yeah, yeah. If you I listen have... to, it's an interesting show because some of the performances are really broad and big and silly, and then some are just like super straight, and like almost over or underdone, I guess. Totally. <laughs> that's an exaggeration, but mm -hmm. sometimes they're looking for that. It's, there's a certain quality to that that's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah. And may I still say it is still very much, like voiceover I still find is still very much um, a male-dominated kind of uh, yep. industry. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, like, I mean, it's gotten a lot better, but definitely for females, uh, the competition is a lot fiercer. Like, we'll look down at a break, uh, like, say if you have a breakdown of a script of, like, male characters versus female characters, they'll be like, all right, ten males and the one female. Yep. <laughs> this is the boys' show, and she's always the plucky best friend. Or, like, she's smarter than all the boys. She's yeah. a bit of a tomboy. She's yeah. smart, maybe a little bit <laughs> anal retentive. Yeah. Kind of, like, a control freak. Yeah. There's, like, a certain, like, yeah. the girl. Like Hermione Granger, and then there's Harry and Ron. She's and never all like always. the gross, <laughs> weird one, no, or the, no. <laughs> you know, totally, the, totally, yeah. And then there's the popular pr uh, prissy one that, like, like oh my god, yeah. yeah exactly. There's always that one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's there. <laughs> She's in there when they need yeah. a villain. So of basically, sorts. 
So basically, our audition story is like, hey, girl. Hey. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> the girl? Yeah, the girl. Well, no, I'm glad you guys mentioned that because for some commercial work, if it says male or female, I, I won't even sometimes go for the audition because depending on the product, it's very obvious they wanted a male voice. Yeah. And they said, we would like a male voice, but females can audition yeah. too. But waste your time recording an audition and send it in for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> totally. But that being said, if you do feel like you, like, could make a good audition of it, like, and even if uh, they're saying, okay, we want a male, but you're like, you know what, I think I could do a really good audition, don't be afraid to take that chance as well. Because yeah. you'd be surprised sometimes. Yeah, I've been in sessions where they've had little incidentals that they've need to, needed to cast where it's just one line and they're not, they haven't animated it yet, so they're not sure if they need a female or a male and, or whatever they need it to be. And so they'll just kind of go popcorn style around the room and everybody will do yeah. one line and oftentimes, like, it's a woman that gets it, so yeah, yeah why not? Yeah. I'll audition for anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> just keep thinking, girl power, girl power, girl yeah. power. Yeah, um, <laughs> totally. But for the fans out there, and now this is a question that I understand if you don't want to answer, but what are your opinions on pay-to-play sites like uh, Voices.com and Voices123 and things like that? Because that's a new avenue for people getting into the business. I haven't had much experience mm -hmm. with them. Um, I mean, I was always taught that you, um, that you don't ever pay anybody to work. Like we have an agent that we give a commission to, but that's only once we have the job and we've been paid. Like yeah. We don't pay him to find us work ahead of time. No. Uh, but I have heard of other like voiceover professionals that have, um, that have used those sites and, and, re and have got gigs through them and recommend them. You're, the, co the competition pool is obviously really massive because it's just anybody online who can submit. And oftentimes they're non-union gigs, which is another reason why I don't end up auditioning for them. So they, you know, they pay less. But it, it uh, might be kind of a fun way if you have no experience mm -hmm. to just practice auditioning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. Because you get used to doing it in a short amount of time. Often there's like a short turnover for those kind of sites. You know, yeah. they have like a 24-hour thing where you have to record and send it in. So. Uh, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Voices, I think there's one that's Voices 1, 2, 3, where you don't have to pay to play, you just get a very limited you're selection thinking, of... You're thinking of Voice Funny, which oh. um, uh, pays very, very little, but it also pays you if you audition and it's accepted. There's a middleman that approves your audition. Oh, yeah. Which I is see. kind of interesting. <laughs> I see. But um, you don't have to pay a fee for that. For Voices 1, 2, 3 and Voices.com, you do, however. Okay. And it's like 300, 400 bucks, depending on when you buy it. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would say, no, that seems like a lot of money. I don't know. What do you yeah. think? I, I, I agree. It does seem pretty steep. But, I, I mean, yeah. again, I don't, I personally don't have uh, experience with that. But, yeah, like, as to echo what Kelly said, I think it is a good way for sometimes people to kind of get their foot in the door, just to get that experience and build that confidence before maybe going out and making a demo tape and then seeking an agent. Well, since you mentioned agent, that was actually going to be my next question. Um, what is your advice on when someone feels that they should go to an agent, or should they just submit to everywhere, even if they're not in the state, so on and so forth? Okay. I think you, you pretty much need to live in the city, or at least within driving distance of a city yeah. that the work is taking place in. So not many agents are gonna even with, if you have experience, like it'd yeah. be hard for me to get an agent in LA or Toronto if I wasn't willing to move there. If I was willing to move there, I could probably get one fairly easily. But um, yeah, if you can't drive in to do the session, then an agent isn't really going to consider you. Uh, you have to live in the city that you're submitting for. So, um, but if you live in a city where there's an animation industry and a lot of agents, then yeah, submit your demo to all of the agents, um, and and then do it again. <laughs> if you haven't heard anything in, I don't know, what, what would you recommend? I, I know definitely all that. I 100% I agree with that. Um, there are, uh, once you are in a city that say is a big voiceover hub, I would definitely recommend taking some classes just so you can get a, a, a feel for what the industry is like in that city. And you're working with professionals that are working in that city. And then, you know, let them, if uh, you have your demo tape already, uh, let them listen to it or, you know, make your demo tape and then make sure it's your best work and then start submitting uh, for agents. Because, I mean, a lot of times, like, an agent doesn't want to hear, like, multiple submissions from one person. 
um, you want to make sure it's your best uh, material the first time you send it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, one thing I, I need to ask, because technology has evolved so much, and it seems like everybody can just get a hold of a home studio or thinks they can. So, <laughs> so uh, what, what is your advice on um, when you should develop one, and what are things that people should look, look into to make sure that it's up to par? My home studio, because at this point, I only record auditions from home. Uh, some auditions I, I record in a studio, it depends on what the producer wants, but I don't record any jobs at home because the, yeah. it just we're never asked to. No. Uh, you need a professional recording studio at home to be able to do that, and they would just never ask to do it, and not at this point anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it's coming <laughs> yeah. someday. So my home setup is a microphone kind of like this, a compressor mic with a USB port that plugs into my laptop. I don't even have a mixer. I have... Um, Audacity, which is like a super duper easy little cut and paste program. And then I have a big roll of um, sound insulation foam and I put it on my dining room table and I kind of squidge inside of it <laughs> like this and I pull my iPad up and I read the audition like this and that's, that is my home studio. That's it. <laughs> You Mine's don't need much. Yours is fancy. Yeah. <laughs> the, the main thing I would say is um, sound dampening. You really don't need a super fancy mic to be able to record auditions, but um, you do need an environment where you aren't going to get, you know, if you clap and you hear it kind of smack back at you, you haven't dampened the sound enough. So you need like blankets or pillows or something like that to, you know, the ideal is like a closet that you can pad, but not everybody has that. Mm -hmm. um, especially we live in a city that has very small apartments and you know it's hard to get that kind of space. Mm -hmm. There are guys we work with who have really skookum amazing Ooh, home studios, yeah. but they do a lot of radio imaging, like Ian Corlett has a really nice home studio, but he records jobs from home. Yeah. Um, and he also, I think, just likes the toys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need much, and I would say when you're first starting out, you really shouldn't be spending a ton of money on some big crazy you know, lovely home studio unless you want to do that for fun as a hobby or start a podcast as well or something like that. You need like just the basics and get a microphone that's right for your voice because what might right be right for my voice isn't going to be right for say Michael Dobson's voice. He's going to need a slightly different yeah. microphone. Totally. Um, my uh, home studio, it's still in development, but uh, I just have a little Yeti mic and uh, it's attached to my MacBook and GarageBand. Um, yep. And that's and that's like still getting fancy for me because <laughs> honestly, like I've recorded a lot of MP3 auditions uh, because nowadays there's more and more I find MP3 audition requests that you record on your own instead of going into a professional studio to record the audition. And so in the past, I've just taken my iPhone and just kind of wiggled my way into uh, my closet with my clothes, shut the doors, yeah. and uh, turned on the light in there and then read off a piece of paper as I'm sitting on the floor um, reading... Uh, and recording this microphone, uh, I mean, this audition on my iPhone. And I literally use uh, that as an excuse to buy clothes because um, <laughs> Pro more soundproofing. Well, exactly, more soundproofing, right? Yeah. So it's like this is part of my job. Including so. shoes, right? Shoes it's are really shoes good for And handbags, <laughs> lots of handbags all around. Yeah, so it's great. <laughs> I totally do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But no, you know, you guys must get toasty in there, though, all wrapped up in your blanket. Oh, yeah. No, there's been times I'm like, okay, like, you know, Well, you have to close coming. all the doors and windows. Oh, yeah. I turn, I, I turn the breaker off on my fridge. Oh, yeah. So it gets, like, warm in there if you're recording in August. Oh, yeah. And it's it's funny because sometimes takes will be ruined because, like, the people upstairs sometimes will go thump, 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 and I'm just like, oi, and we have a really good take. garbage trucks in our back lane, and we have a toddler <laughs> that lives upstairs in our place because we're in an apartment. Oh, no. So, yeah, I'll be like... Come on, let's go to the... Oh, damn it. <laughs> Just like wait. No, wait it out. Okay. Come on, let... <laughs> nope. Come on, let's go to... <laughs> and then you end up cutting together this really crazy, stilted audition. <laughs> well, yeah. so the last question... The glamorous side of voiceover. <laughs> the best side. But the last question I'm going to ask um, before we do Q&A with the fans out there, so I don't know if you guys want to do line up or how that works, but um, when it comes to... Um, uh, like uh, headphones, this was an interesting debate I was just in, so I'm curious. Headphones on or off? Because when your headphones are on, you can hear yourself while you're recording, but some people find it more comfortable to have them off so there's, there's nothing distracting them. Um, I mean, it's, it's really what your preference is, right? Because uh, 
like, I mean, I find the headphones can be comforting, especially if we're in a professional studio uh, situation. Um, but definitely when I'm recording at home, like, I don't have headphones attached to my iPhone. So, you know, you don't need headphones to act, as Terry Klassen, the d director of the show, would say. So, I, I think it's really what your personal preference is and whether they're available to you or not. I like the one-on, one-off, because I like yeah. being able to hear my voice in the room, but also what it sounds like through the mic. Um, I've been told by an engineer that you get a better performance without headphones, but you get a lot more techie stuff um, without them as well. So when your headphones are off, you aren't able to hear if you've popped to pee or if like some weird little technical crackle has happened until you listen back to it. Um, you aren't able to hear if you overlap with another actor in a studio and wreck a take. So that technical stuff, you just don't get without headphones. And it's also kind of sometimes hard to hear direction as well, if there's yeah. people talking in the room while the director's totally. talking. Some directors have a preference, and you don't get a choice. You either wear them if they want you to wear them or not. Totally. But um, I like the one-off, one-off. That's my favorite. <laughs> That's my jam. Can I talk for a second just about warming up as well? Yeah, please do. Um, I feel like that's really important and everybody has the way that they keep their voice healthy, like no caffeine and all that fun stuff. Right. So. I don't actually do a lot of warming up before sessions. I'll warm up before I sing, um, but I don't really do a ton of warm up before a session unless it's something that's like really strenuous on my voice. Mm -hmm. But I lost my voice a couple of years ago. I lost my voice for a month. I got really, really ill. And I went to a speech pathologist, and one of the tricks she showed me, because I was getting this really crispy, I was super, um, lots of vocal fatigue, and my voice was just kind of blowing out at the end of sessions because it hadn't recovered yet. So she taught me to put a straw in a bottle of water, oh, this is a big bottle, taller than my straw, and to blow bubbles on sound, like so. <laughs> you do that for a little bit, and what happens is the pressure leaving your lungs meets the back pressure of the water and the straw, and it allows your vocal cords to just kind of stretch and float and relax. She calls it the reset. So if you're ever starting to, f you know, that really tired feeling in your voice, blowing bubbles is an awesome way to kind of stretch the muscles. Mm -hmm. You can try it, and if it feels worse, then obviously you know, don't do it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I find it a big help. That's one of my favorite warm-up tricks. And then also just taking care of your voice. Lots of water, don't smoke, get sleep. Um, what else? Yeah, hydrate, hydrate. Yeah. Avoid spicy food right before a session. Or <laughs> dairy products or citrus. Yeah, yeah. Just because uh, milk, just because it causes a lot of or phlegm. Yes, a lot of phlegms with a lot of dairy products, and citrus because citrus actually makes your uh, vocal cords um, contract. So, and you want them kind of relaxed and open when you're recording. Yeah, it's like a muscle. Like think about the mm -hmm. kind of things an athlete would do, mm -hmm. and then kind of sort of do those things for your voice. Yeah. Exercise it, use it, stretch it, but don't push it, and learn to protect it if you feel like it's. Um, getting crispy. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we do the first Q&A uh, question, we actually have another uh, guest on the panel, known for her voice of Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy, as well as the work in Dragon Ball and Gundam Double Earth, Andrea Lippin. Hi. Hi. Sorry I'm late. It's okay, we'll forgive you because you're cute. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I don't forgive you. Bumble. I didn't think okay, so. I forgive you. <laughs> I'll have whatever kitty mark you say. <laughs> well, just so you know, we're just about to start taking a Q&A from um, our wonderful attendees. So first question, please. Hi. Uh, my question is, how do you know when you're ready to submit a demo? I would say try to find somebody to listen to it yeah. who's, who's in the biz and mm -hmm. to give you feedback. Because it's hard to tell. It's hard yeah. to assess your own work, right? Totally. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think you actually um, answered my original question, which was how, did, how do you take care of your voice? Um, but so my next question is if you're not really 
if you don't really want to make a profession in like singing or acting, you just want to do voice acting, like how could you get into the business? Um, define voice acting because that kind of all encompasses like, maybe the maybe not just maybe not like commercials, just like characters and cartoons. Oh, anime. so you mean just animation? Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, if you are like fortunate enough to get a, an agent or say like online submissions, just submit for animation or just specify like, you know what, like I'm not so crazy about doing commercial work um, or singing, I, I just like to do animation, then I'm sure that would be okay. Though at the same time, we're in a business where uh, it is very competitive and sometimes uh, being employed is uh, like it, it, it's, it, you have your, your highs and you have your lows, so why not give yourself uh, the opportunities to be, like whether if you are a singer or to do commercials as well as animation, right? Give mm -hmm. yourself those opportunities to be that much more employable. Right. That would be my advice. Right. At first, I think too, any credits you can, any professional credits you can get is great because it yeah. shows people mm -hmm. that you're employable, that you're directable. And so, you know, if you get offered a commercial gig, then I would advise, unless you have some kind of ethical problem with selling products, but we're on a show about toys sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard to find an animation, you know, production that isn't correlated with some kind of merchandising. Um, then I would say take that gig and just get yeah. the experience of doing it. And then, you know, if you want to be choosy later, you can be choosy later, but it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, first off, uh, big fan. <laughs> um, so I'm no uh, stranger to the stage, singing and rapping. I've been in a lot of performances in my life. However, I just want to start off in voice acting as well. What are like, some tips that you can recommend to someone who's starting off in voice acting, but who's familiar with other aspects of performing? Oh, <laughs> you, want, you, want to give you want me to participate in the panel? <laughs> yes, please. That's weird. It's time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you've covered, so I've been kind of quiet. But um, I would just say for voice acting in general, reading is really a great yeah. skill to have. Read, read, read. Read books, read everything you can, and reading out loud, kind of on top of that. But uh, you need to be able to, like we did to earlier today, just get something put in front of you and read it and perform it the first time you see it. So I would say to practice that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Totes. Totes. Good Totes one. my goats. <laughs> Everybody's in agreement. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Okay, first of all, it's a nice meeting all of you. I gave a major. Yay. And, and second, <laughs> and, 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 okay, and my question, my question is like, uh, aside, aside from your works on My Little Pony, you know, like what was probably like your best and or worst experience when it comes to any form of voice acting? Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, you could take your time if you need to. <laughs> uh, we have well, to be diplomatic about the worst. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I think probably, uh, I wouldn't say it was the worst though. Like, I mean, you know, I'm just, I, I love coming to work, um, every day, really. I, I really enjoy what I do for work. But yeah, a commercial, a commercial I actually did recently, it was, um, for a healthcare system, and anyways, I had to uh, say I had a one tiny line. It was just like Erica, run, and then I had to do like a high blood curdling scream, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and uh, anyways, uh, I think the directors they were just like, oh well, that scream uh, it just sounds like two horror movies. So then I do it again, and they're like, oh well, um, that scream it just like sounded like a little bit uh, too long. Like, uh, so can you make it shorter? And then the next one, it was like, oh, can you make it longer? Um, so it, it, it was re a real lesson in preserving my voice, right? Because definitely after that session, I was feeling a little bit, um, it, it, my vocal cords were definitely feeling worked. Oh. So I think definitely uh, that was kind of a lesson and maybe not one of the, the a greater days where walking out of the booth, I was pretty tired. <laughs> yeah, those are always the hardest days. Um, I don't have a specific experience, but it happens all the time like, well, often enough that when you feel like you're not getting it and that they're not happy and kind of all of the choices you, you're making are the wrong ones and like that, those are the, those are the hard days. Totally. Or the days when you have a lot of people in the room, you have producers and directors mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of clients and stuff and they're not on the same page about what they all want. Mm -hmm. 
and you're trying to please four or five people with four or five different ideas, but you're yeah. kind of the conduit that they mm. all go through, and they're sort of using you to figure out what it is they want. Yes. Yeah. Um, those are those are the hard those are the hard days. Those are the days where it's good to kind of repeat back the direction you've been given and specify what they want before you attempt it a million times. Because oftentimes they don't quite know what they're asking for. Sometimes you get an inexperienced director yeah. that doesn't really know how to direct. So sometimes they ask you to do stuff that's not really playable. Yeah. Um, you know, like I've been, giving, I've been given direction that's like, well, she, when she's animated, like she uses her hands a lot. I'm like, okay, how am I gonna play that? <laughs> with my voice, like, do you mean like she's excitable? Yeah, 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 that's what we mean. Oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. So it's, those are the times where it's good to sort of clarify what they mean by that. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree with those things, uh, for sure. It's just, um, oh, the person's gone. <laughs> I guess it's over. <laughs> Well, I'm still interested in your answer. Um, well, I forget why well, I lost my train of thought, so I'll take the next one. <laughs> All right, the next one. the hills, yes. Um, hi, I want to be a voice actor when I'm older. Does it help to get into voice acting when you're younger to um, get experience and have connections with other directors? Sure does. It also helps to do any kind of, do you like to do like stage acting yeah. or like, yeah, do yeah. all the acting that you can do if mm -hmm. that's your passion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Good luck. You're welcome. Yeah, we'll see you in the studio one day. Um, hi, first off, really big fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have like any advice of how to get higher and better in your career, like um, step by step? I just, I always say, and this is, I teach piano as well, so it's such a piano teacher thing to say, but I always say practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. It's really true. The more you do something, anything that you want to do, like a hobby, the more you do it, the better you are. So, you know, you can practice on your own, you can practice recording, you can listen to lots of, and watch different cartoons and, and imitate and you know, be creative, but I think the more you do something, the better you get, and it goes for almost everything. Working hard always pays off. Absolutely, and uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. What other job do you get to watch cartoons for as research? I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Like, no, Mom, I need to watch the show. <laughs> for my future career. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I usually play with my voice at home, so how can you guys like, um, like um, keep your voice as that role if you're in a cartoon? Because I can't do this for too long. How do we, how do we maintain one role, yeah. do you mean, for a whole thing and not make it like a different character halfway through? Yeah. Is that kind of your question? Is that going to pause through? Well, a director hopefully will help you do that. And one of the things they do that's really handy is they give you a ref. So when you first record an episode of something, they keep a little snippet of it, and even if you don't play that character for like three months or something, and you play a whole bunch of stuff in between, you come in and they play your ref, which is a reference for you. And it's that one little snippet of what you did, and it makes you go, oh, right, I remember what I did three months ago. And then it also sometimes helps to have one little tagline or one little thing that you say that you always know you can kind of say in that character's yeah. voice, and you can say that before you do, you do a scene that kind of like catapults you into that character again. But sometimes that's a tricky thing. Sometimes you can drift out of character. Totally. It can be close, or if you're playing two characters on a show that are kind of close together, sometimes you have to be like careful that they're not swinging into one or other. I played a mother and a daughter on a show that had kind of similar voices, and that was always tricky if they were in a scene together talking to each other to make sure they were integral, but sort of still different at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're welcome. <laughs> Good mic handling, by the way. Yes. <laughs> He's a pro. Hi there. Hi. My question is, uh, how can I find a decent agent for voice acting? Do you live in a city where it's where uh, voiceover work is uh, a large community? Well, no. I live in a small town that has uh, a sort of theater near. So. Okay. 
Well, um, if you, you know, are you into doing theater work? Absolutely. Okay, so if you already aren't, then I would suggest, you know, getting into that theater or trying to your best. Um, the only other advice I could possibly give is, unfortunately, moving from your hometown and moving to a big city that has voiceover work and it has right. that voiceover community. Because, yeah, like Vancouver is one of the big voiceover hubs in Canada. Other places probably be like Montreal, Toronto, and that's about it as far as uh, I'm aware of. And I I'm, I think maybe yeah. a little bit in Texas, a little bit some in anime Texas. stuff. Oh yeah, for Can I was just sorry, I was just talking about Canada, for example. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for the States, of course, it'd be LA uh, or New York would be probably the two big uh, uh, communities for voiceover work. But yeah, that would be my first step in order to find an agent because like Kelly mentioned earlier in um, the interview that a lot of agents won't consider you unless you are in that city and able to drive to the auditions. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's a scary thing though. <laughs> Easier said than done. There are some un unreputable, irreputable? I think it's irreputable. People that aren't reputable agents. <laughs> Um, and it's important to remember, like I mentioned before, you never pay an agent before you get a job, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and then it helps to ask around other people, you know? Like, mm -hmm. who's your agent and who do you like? And you get a good sense of, of who's good and who's, who's yeah. reputable. Um, if you want a unionized, an agent that mostly sends you for union work, then you can contact whatever local union represents actors in that area and they can give you a list of agents they know of, too. Mm -hmm. And avoid like any agencies or any kind of classes that try to sell you on this idea that you'll be an overnight success, you will be a star, we'll make you into a star. It's like, no, no, no. Like very rarely uh, does overnight success happen, I believe. I think, you know, right. it, it takes time and putting in uh, kind of uh, earning your stripes, as, mm -hmm. as, it, as they say. So, things to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, knowing myself, I'm, I can be very shy when it comes to singing or doing some kind of voice impression of a certain character in front of other people, including my family. And knowing right now, I'm very nervous, excited to be in front of such great people. <laughs> but word. I was wondering if you guys had any tips for very shy voice actors or actresses? Never dealt with that. <laughs> we're all, like, look um, at us now, we're, we're like, we all uh, the kid in the living room that was like, look, look at me! <laughs> yeah, um, well, I would say, I don't know, try and do your best to come out of your shell. Maybe your family's a good way to start, right? Maybe mm -hmm. they're somewhere to practice, some people to practice on, like a first step. Absolutely, and like actually, like my closest friends and my family are the people I'm most nervous to perform in front of because, yeah. you know, they're so close to me and I love them so much. Is that I care the most what they think more than say a stranger because I guess in my mind and maybe I'm wrong. I'm like, oh, I'm never gonna see them again. Where if it's you know it, whether it's um, a loved one um, or a really close friend, it's like, oh God, you know, I want them to think the best of me and oh, oh, oh. so um, and sometimes yeah, like there have been times I've. I know that the best thing uh, to get over nerves is to just push myself off the edge. So sometimes yeah. even if I am too nervous, like I'll go find uh, my boyfriend or my, uh, my friend uh, or something and I'll be like, okay, here I go, <laughs> and then just go for it. And sometimes throwing yourself into the shark tank, as uh, nasty as it sounds, is the best way to get over your nerves. Exposure just go for it. therapy. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, as an online voice actor myself, there have been uh, occasions where I get cast as multiple roles in a single project, like for Andrea as like Pinky and Flutters, or Kasumi as the singing voice of Luna, Rarity, and uh, Adagio. Uh, have there ever been any instances where you feel like you do a take and it's like, oh wait, that sounds too much like this other character I do in a different Ooh, thing? Yeah. And uh, if so, are there like any tips to sort of get out of that state of mind and just fo focus on what's in front of you and, and, that, sort, and that sort of stuff? like that, if that makes any sense. Well, when you mean a different thing, do you mean a different project? Like a different project or like a completely different character that sounds similar to uh, like the one you're doing like well, in the session as a... As a I, I really believe that whatever project you're on, it's, you know, the directors and the producers are gonna want what 
they want. And it, sometimes you get pushed into something, you're like, oh, I did this before. But if it's a different project, I, I really don't think it matters. Like, if it's going to start to sound similar, that's kind of, you know, you're, there's only so many places you can go within your voice box, and I think that's okay. Um, if it's on the same project, then that's an issue. You have to find some separation there, but um, I, I don't think there's a problem with that. Personally, no, and yeah, not on different projects for sure. I wouldn't have a career otherwise. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. For sure, yeah. Tons of my stuff sounds the same. Yeah. It's just different, co different colors and flavors and yeah. circumstances. But a lot of the time, like the same sort of placement. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And also, I guess the suggestion for me is not to uh, just focus on the final product, on like on the voices. Is focusing on characteristics, especially if it's on the same project. Focusing on characteristics that make those two characters different from one another. Just and each other. Yeah, and then focus on that, and eventually, like by not focusing on the final product, just focusing on those characteristics and what make them different, eventually you'll find that those characters just come out. Um, that's my best suggestion. Just pretty much staying in the moment and not thinking too far ahead. Yeah, if, because I think yeah. the problem is is thinking of like, oh, okay, what does it sound like? What does it sound like? But you know, you can work on a character for hours and hours and develop it and develop it. So especially when you're developing a character, just focus on what makes them different and not on just like the final product and what it sounds like. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, being in theater myself, one of the most difficult things that I had to accept at that point was to accept failures and I wanted to know, how did you handle your first rejections? Mm. A crowd. <laughs> a crowd. <laughs> Night chocolate. <laughs> Lots of it. <laughs> um, that's the thing with this job is you're rejected more than you're accepted. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like like ninety five to five or something, For right? Sure. The majority of the yeah. time. Vast majority of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of part of the job is the, the job is going on a whole bunch of job interviews all the time. Yeah. And then sometimes you actually get to work. But most yeah. of it is just trying out to see if you fit for the project. Yeah. And so how you deal with that part of it, I just think is maybe we all sort of inherently have personalities that we're okay with that, that we're able to just sort of let things go. But it's, I would look at it as great practice in letting things go and realizing that there could be a million reasons why you're not cast totally. for that part mm -hmm. um, and not take any of them personally. And you could yeah. have been the top two, who mm -hmm. knows? It doesn't mean you weren't good. Mm -hmm. It just means that, you know, someone has to get it and everybody else does it. Um, and I think also one of the great things that I learned through theater school was also creating my own work. So I have my own theater company and I do my own work and I get to do stuff that I'm excited about. I know I have a part in my show. <laughs> I'm organizing the thing. And that's really empowering to do your own, to put on your own plays, to do your own podcast, to to write your own stuff, like write a radio play and record it and put it up. And even if it's just your friends and family that see it, that's cool. It's really empowering to make your own things. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to rely so much on sort of getting approval from other people. Yeah. Thanks. The way, well, my personal approach just um, for me, and I think everyone's really different, is when I, I go to an audition, I prepare for it, and then I walk out of there and I, psh, I forget about it. And I'm so good at that to the point where people are like, oh, do you audition for this? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't. Because if you think about it and you're, oh, I wonder what happened with that. And you don't know. They might have, they might never cast it. They might cast it the next day. They might cast it in a year. And you just don't know. So then when I, when you get the phone call, it's like, oh, you're, what was that again? Yeah, you that booked for this. Yay! And it's like, it's a nice surprise. That's how I always think about it. It's always like, oh, what a nice surprise that I, so, you know, just, Zero expectations is kind of just that's just how I roll, but yeah, everyone's different. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Thanks. You're awesome. Thank you. and, and just so you know, this last question will be your last. Oh, oh sorry, guys. Sorry. I'm sure you had amazing questions. Yeah. Hello. Okay, so my question is um, like y'all said you use Audacity, GarageBand, and stuff like that. Um, my question is when you're editing your own stuff, uh, what effects would you use to heighten the quality of the recording? Because I know there's like noise cancel, uh, fade in, fade out with the silence in between and all this stuff, but uh, what would you suggest? 
Nothing. <laughs> yeah. I just heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing. No yeah. effects. Yeah. I, I think it. I don't think they would like it if you did that either. Oh, yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I'm not good no. at this stuff. No, but I, there's like yeah, a button. Either. I use GarageBand, and there's like a button that's no effects. Yeah. And I click that. Yeah. Because okay. they want to hear your voice raw, like. Well, how I it mean is. raw, but I mean like getting rid of the like any like background. Okay. Oh, okay. Is there a way to do that? that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you tell us. Tell us the ways. <laughs> Uh, you highlight like a uh, section where oh, she got faith. <laughs> <laughs> you highlight like a space where you're not talking at all, but like there's just like shh yeah. going on. I still can't get rid of a motor. It's ridiculous how you can't get rid of a motor. But um, you get like you highlight that uh, on Audacity. You click uh, a noise cancel button, and then there's the noise profile. Get noise profile. Then you highlight the whole entire track, and then uh, click noise, prof uh, noise removal again, and then you click the OK button instead. And then it just huh. gets rid of there most of the noise. There you go. There we I'm are. Try yeah. that out next time. Yeah. You are smarter than me. So I know, right? Yes. Like, oh. Do that. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, but obviously, you don't have to in order to get work because none of us had any idea. What <laughs> <you were doing. laughs> Good to know, though. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question, and thanks so much for being on the panel with me Thank today, you. guys. Your questions were great. See you in the studio one day. And you guys enjoy the rest of BronyCon. Does anyone want a straw? <laughs> no.